Some skin conditions are temporary and will go away on their own, but others like eczema, acne, and rosacea may require the expertise of a physician, like my guest today. I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Heckman. He's a board-certified family physician with a special interest in treating dermatological conditions and performing skin procedures, and I've got many questions for him, including some questions about skin cancer, so I hope he's ready. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Doctor, thanks so much for your time today. We're going to talk about uh, the common skin conditions that many of us experience uh, when we're younger and then as we age through the years. And so great to have your expertise today. We'll start here. What is eczema and what causes it? So eczema essentially is just a broad term for dermatitis or inflammation of the skin. And you can think about this in a way of what would cause this inflammation of the skin. Usually it is due to a decreased barrier function of the skin. So it it makes it more leaky where water can then evaporate out. That leads to dryness, which leads to irritation, which leads to itching. And itching triggers that whole inflammatory cascade of redness and thickening of the skin. And it can even get infected. Yeah, and so in my experiences over the years, I I see folks with eczema on their elbows, on their knees. Is that the only places folks get eczema, or can it be other places as well? So it depends on what age the person is. So this is classically a condition of child, and it does actually affect like 5 to 20% of children worldwide. And that's where you'll see it in the flexural surfaces. We call it the antecubital fossa or the area that's on the front side of your elbows, um, on the back side of your knees. And then for whatever reason, into adulthood, it does change over to the kneecaps and the elbows themselves. Yeah, that's been my experience. And I've always wondered, is it just itchy? Is it also painful? And are folks making it worse by scratching? It is itchy. If it gets infected, it can become painful. And yeah, as I did mention, so if you are scratching this, that is actually an injury to your skin and that calls in more inflammatory cells that then propagate the itching and it becomes this vicious cycle. And it really isn't broken until you do treat it topically. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's like uh, this uh, sort of vicious cycle that we're contributing to our own misery in a way. So I'm assuming, as you mentioned, treatment, there is treatment for eczema. I think the main question is, because again, as you continue to see folks have this in adulthood, is that treatment permanent or is it sort of a temporary fix? As this is most common in children, our skin does thicken and we produce more natural oils as we age. And so this kind of fills in the gaps of that leaky skin barrier, which then naturally treats it. So essentially, people generally grow out of this eczema condition. But in childhood, to basically treat it, you first want to prevent it. So you want to fill in the gaps of that leaky skin with a natural moisturizer free of fragrances such as CeraVe products or Vaseline. If it does progress to the actual redness and itching stage, you want to basically pop the inflammatory cells with a topical corticosteroid. All right. You know, I'm just uh, thinking this through a little bit. This sounds unpleasant for children, of course. But as you say, if it's treated, perhaps treated early, treated properly, then maybe it's not something that persists for the rest of someone's life, hopefully, right? Yes. In childhood, you tend to see more flares in the drier seasons, like in winter. And so you do just have to try to prevent it with moisturizing. But if that fails, you have to periodically treat it with topical steroids. And depending on the individual, it can be more or less severe. But as I said before, too, it can improve with age. So as the skin thickens and gets more natural oils, they should grow out of it. Yeah, good to know. And let's uh, switch up here and um, switch to acne. What essentially is acne? And are there things that we do? Is it genetic, family history, or is it behavior and lifestyle? Is it a whole combination of things that leads to acne? Acne, or it's really called acne vulgaris, which in Latin means common acne, is, well, to learn about it, we basically have to realize the normal function of skin. So your skin has a bunch of pores, as I'm sure most people are familiar with. And in those pores, there is released oily substance called sebum, that acts as that natural moisturizer to coat the skin, to prevent it from getting dry, and essentially to prevent eczema. So when this oil is either overproduced or 
when this oil becomes trapped in the pores by clumped dead skin cells, it becomes food for bacteria that are on your skin that then grow, lead to an infection that call in a bunch of inflammatory cells, and that creates this pus-filled bump. Most of us commonly associate acne with uh, teenagers, with adolescents, but you also see adults with acne as well. And so it sounds to me like for some folks, maybe this is avoidable. For some, it's not. What are you doing in terms of treatment? I'm sure there's a whole range depending on the type of acne and where it is and so on, but maybe you can cover the broad strokes. Correct. Yes. So teenagers, you see it most commonly because when they have those hormones start to increase, that actually directly stimulates increased production of the this oil or sebum. So with more oil, you'll get more bacteria growth and then these inflammatory bumps. So for that sort of population, you can't really control their hormone levels. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> you, you basically try to control the bacteria by killing it with either some topical treatments or an oral antibiotic. And I'm sure for adults who suffer from acne, you know, it's one thing for teenagers because it's expected, as you say, you can't control the hormones. They're a contributing factor in this. But for adults, in terms of self-esteem, confidence, and so on, uh, do, do you find yourself treating a lot of adults in the office? And w- do you do anything differently for them than you would for teens? I do. And it, there are several types of acne, and there's, there is a huge genetic component to it. So some people's skin just flakes more easily and that skin gets stuck in the pores and creates acne more easily. So yeah, in adults, we typically do a topical vitamin A derivative called a retinoid. Many people may have heard of retinol products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that kind of increases the turnover of skin cells and gets rid of those dead skin cells that hang around to prevent acne from forming. There's also other types of acne such that flare like in women around their menstrual cycles. And in those cases, we can sometimes use a medicine to try to decrease their hormone just a little bit. If it is so severe that the inflammation is so deep and causing cystic formation and scarring, there is the ultimate treatment that is high dose oral vitamin A, also called Accutane, available. So that should just be in the back of people's minds if their acne does get out of control. All right, doctor, let's switch up and uh, talk about rosacea. I don't know a lot about this. I've heard of it. I, I think I can spot it. But from an expert here, maybe you can take us through this. What is it? What are the symptoms? What treatments are available and so on? So rosacea, the full name is actually acne rosacea. And I'm guessing the rosacea component is Latin for rose colored. So it's really this red flushing appearance of people's faces as they age. And it can be associated with inflammatory bumps as well, which is where the acne part of that name comes from too. Would you like me to talk through how it develops? Yeah, let's do that. As you say, that there's a sort of an acne component to it as well, but that redness, what causes it? Do we know? How do you treat it? And so on. Yes, there's two t- main types of acne rosacea. And to understand kind of the types and also how it's treated, let's learn how it arises. So there is a genetic component, but essentially it's from chronic sun damage. So the UV rays damage the skin and create these little micro scars in the skin that then change the architecture and cause the skin to regrow abnormally. Sometimes this traps the secretions and also causes the blood vessels to become very tortuous or twisty and show up more easily underneath the skin. That's really interesting. It's so great to have experts on to understand this because I've often wondered, what is that exactly and what causes that? Are there things that we do besides, you said there's a maybe a genetic component of the things that we do that contribute to this, that further this, and what are you doing? What can you do to help folks? So it depends which type. So if the regrowth of these skin cells are trapping secretions and creating inflammatory bumps, then we want to treat it similar to how we treat acne vulgaris, which is usually a topical antibiotic. 
to try to help calm down the inflammation and kill the bacteria causing these bumps. If it is an abnormal growth of blood vessels called telangiectasias, we want to try to treat basically the flushing part of that. So make the blood vessels smaller and also avoid foods and environmental triggers that can flare the blood vessels and cause them to get bigger. Gotcha. So again, as we were talking through things today, whether it's acne or eczema, so there, there are things that can be done. There is treatment available, even if it's just to control the flare-ups or, or tamp down the flare-ups, which is good to know. Let's switch a little more seriously now to skin cancer. And if we have a, a particular growth, does that automatically mean that's cancer? How do we know the difference between harmless things and more cancerous ones? So most often... It's not cancer. Most growths are benign, but you always want to err on the side of caution, especially if you're concerned. But typically, the benign growths that we most commonly see are these slow-growing collection of healthy cells. So it could be skin cells, blood vessels, oil glands, or basically appearing as skin tags or these kind of waxy, stuck-on barnacles, <laughs> as barnacles. they're called. Yes, affectionately termed age barnacles, the seborrheic keratoses. That, that's probably what I'm asked the most commonly sure. in the clinic if it's cancer. Yeah, I've got a few of those barnacles. I, I think I refer to them to a dermatologist as, uh, what are these little crusty things? And she's like, ah, those are fine. Those are normal. And I was like, okay, good, because they weren't there at one time in my life, and now I have the barnacles, Doc. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. What about uh, freckles and moles and, and those types of things? It's just like as we get older, you just look and go, hey, I didn't used to have that there. What is that exactly? And should we rush to the dermatologist to, to be checked out if we have one of those things that we didn't used to have? For moles specifically, so those are a collection of pigment cells that grow. And the way we determine if they're concerning or not is, first of all, does, does that lesion that you're looking at, does that stand out from the rest of your moles? If it does, that could be a little concerning. If it's the ugly duckling mole. And secondly, we use this A, B, C, D, E criteria. So the A stands for asymmetry. Is it not symmetrical appearing or kind of irregularly shaped? The B is for borders. Are there kind of irregular borders or ulcerating borders? C is for color. If there's multiple colors involved, that's more concerning. D is for diameter. If it is larger than half a centimeter, that is concerning. And finally, E is for evolution. So is it rapidly changing over time? Is it causing itching that it wasn't causing before or bleeding when it didn't used to bleed? Is one of the complications with things like this that what may be normal for one person is not, you know, sort of abnormal for someone else? So when you look at someone and they have a particular type of mole, but they have more than one of them, do you say, oh, that's normal for you and we'll keep an eye on it? But if you see only one of those on someone else, you go, you know, that's not like your other moles. Maybe we should biopsy this or whatever. Is that one of the complications for you is trying to figure out what's normal for a person, you know, an individual? That's exactly right. Yes. If something sticks out clearly, and is, like I said, it's the ugly duckling mole and appears to be changing based on those A, B, C, D, E criteria, we will likely want to biopsy or sample that and look at it under a microscope to make sure that it's not cancer. Whereas if, if someone has a bunch of moles on their body, they are at high risk of having uh, skin cancer, but we will look to see if one stands out more than the rest. Definitely. This has been really educational today. I have just a couple more questions for you. I want to talk, and I'm 53, so I'm not quite a senior yet, but I am a member of AARP because, you know, I wanted the free tote bag. <laughs> uh, anyway, so when we think about as we get older, and especially seniors, they tend to have a thinner and drier skin. Is there anything that they can do about that? Is there anything that we can do when we're younger to maybe not have that thinner, drier skin as we age? Two words, Scott. Sunscreen. Yes. <laughs> Sunscreen. <laughs> so I know you've heard this a lot. Dermatologists sound like broken records in saying it, but it is true. So the sun UV rays do damage the skin and basically cause scarring and take away uh, a healthy fatty protective barrier underneath the skin. So that thins your skin over time with the more exposure to the sunlight. 
Yeah, and I, I harp on that with my kids. My kids are 14 and 19, and they actually both went away for spring break to warm climates. And I said, please use sunscreen. And they kind of rolled their eyes at me, and I said, you'll thank me later. <laughs> I may not be around for you to thank, but when you're older and maybe you don't end up with skin cancer or you don't have the thin, dry skin, you can say, it's so good that we listen to Dad and we use sunscreen, even when he wasn't around to police it, right? Very true. And when you're thinking about SPFs, you want to go at least 30-plus, the absolute best protection is obviously physical protection like a wide-brimmed hat or UV shirts. But I also really like zinc oxide. It can leave you looking pretty white like a ghost, but it does protect the most. Doctor, as I said, this was really educational and fun today. Is there anything that we can do to eliminate wrinkles, to prevent them. I hate to focus on aesthetics and appearance, but let's be honest. You get to a certain age and you look in the mirror and you think, geez, these things here around my eyes, these things didn't used to be here. Should I have done something? I know what your answer is going to be. Yeah, you should have worn sunscreen. But besides that, doctor, <laughs> what else? what else can we do to prevent wrinkles? So yes, that's exactly right. So interesting enough, the same treatment for acne, retinol products, believe it or not, cause skin rejuvenation and take away some of those fine wrinkles in your skin because they increase the turnover and get rid of those old wrinkly cells. Uh, This has been really great, doctor. And I think my takeaways, and I'm sure for listeners are as well, that Sometimes it's genetics and family history. Sometimes it's behavior and lifestyle. Uh, A lot of times, in fact, maybe in all cases, things can be looked at, can be treated. We have experts like yourself to help us get through this stuff. And uh, we need to do our part. We need to wear sunscreen. We need to protect our skin. We need to reach out to a doctor when something doesn't look right or feel right. So, doctor, thanks so much for your time today. You stay well. Thank you so much, Scott, for having me. To learn more about common skin conditions, visit franciscanhealth.org and search skin conditions. And if you found this podcast to be helpful, please share it on your social channels. And be sure to check out the full podcast library for additional topics of interest. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Stay well, and we'll talk again next time.